Shall we turn to, uh, once again, to the letter of Apostle Paul to the Corinthians, 2 Corinthians chapter 6, 2 Corinthians chapter 6, and we shall read verse 1, verse 1. We then, as workers together with him, beseech you also that you receive not the grace of God in vain. And the title this evening is The Challenges That Christ's Disciples Face. The Challenges That Christ's Disciples Face. Apostle Paul is writing and asking the disciples that do the work of the gospel that they do not receive the grace of God given to them in vain. Apostle Paul includes those that work closely with him for the gospel and says, we, we, the workers of the gospel, that work together. We, the we bring out a strong sense of solidarity with the workers of the gospel. Paul wants to extend this sense of solidarity with the rest of the laborers spread in different parts of the world. Paul is establishing a strong binding together of workers of the gospel. He beseeches. He says, we then as workers together with him beseech you. He almost begs, saying, the grace that you have received, do not make it vain. Don't make it empty. Don't make it useless. And straight away, this becomes a challenge for all of us that are called to be the disciples of the Lord Jesus Christ. All those that are born again and are baptized in the name of the Lord has been blessed with the grace of God. It is the greatest favor that the Lord has bestowed upon us. What have you done with it? How have you used it? Verse 2 is interesting to note. Paul writes, For he saith, I have heard thee in a time accepted, and in the day of salvation have I succored, that is, I helped thee. Behold, now is the accepted time. Behold, now is a day of salvation. Well, let us, let us read once again from verse 1 and see the connection. So, verse 1, We then, as workers together with him, beseech you also that you receive not the grace of God in vain. Here we stop and ask the question, Have you received God's grace, his favor, in vain? And the answer that Apostle Paul gives is, For he said, I have heard thee in a time accepted, and in the day of salvation have I succored thee. Behold, now is the accepted time. Behold, now is the day of salvation. Now this verse may seem out of context, but it is not. It is taken from Isaiah chapter 49 the first reading that we read. The Lord says to Israel, Thou art my servant, O Israel. I will give you for a light to the Gentiles, that you may be my salvation unto the end of the earth. In the same chapter, Isaiah 49 verse 8, uh, goes on saying, the Lord goes on saying, goes to say, Thus saith the Lord, in an acceptable time have I heard thee, and in the day of salvation have I helped thee, and I will preserve thee and give thee for a covenant of the people. 
to establish the earth, to cause to inherit the desolate heritages, that thou mayst say to the prisoners, Go forth to them that are in darkness, show, their, show, show yourselves. The God made his covenant with Israel so that they become his voice, his witness, the preachers of his salvation. But what did they do? They cast it aside. Paul is saying to the workers in the gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ, don't be like them. Don't make the grace of God useless. Don't make it vain. For God in the day of salvation has heard you and helped you. And now it is the accepted time for the salvation of others. Now is the day of salvation for others that they might hear the gospel, the good news of salvation. So what are you doing with the grace given to you? Are you going in circles about yourself all the time? Are you making yourself more important than the kingdom of God? Are you making yourself more important and wiser than the salvation of others? Where is your heart? Is it on the will of God, your Father, or on your own self-will? For where your treasure is, the Lord Jesus says, there your heart will be. Verse 3 of 2 Corinthians chapter, three, of chapter 6, giving no offense in anything that the ministry be not blamed. Now, although Paul is primarily speaking to those that are called to ministry of the gospel, the preaching of the gospel, he wants all Christians to understand that we, as the followers of Christ, do not become an offense. We, as the witnesses of Christ Jesus, do not become a cause of stumbling among the believing brethren and the non-believing people. The workers in the Lord's vineyard must not lead others into error or in sin. There are too many today that compromise and mix the doctrines to please others. And those that hold the office of preaching the gospel and even others insist in this day and age that they believe uh, that they believe that they can decide and live according to their own mind. Yes, we are a Christian, I am a Christian, but I can decide how I have to live. They don't have to follow the instruction and commands laid by God in his word, they say. Will they say the same? To the draconian environmental laws that are being set up, by the globalist elite. The non-Christians say, I have my own religion. Similarly, we find Christians that say, I have my own way of living a Christian life. Nobody can tell me how to live my Christian life. So what's the point of having the word of God then? What's the point of having a manual if we are not going to follow the instruction that comes from God. From the beginning, God chose and called the people of Abraham to live in a certain manner. God specifically told them that they will not live according to the ways that the other nations have been living all this time. So God gave them new commands. God gave them new instructions to live in a new manner according to his will. The Lord Jesus Christ chose and called his people not to live according to their own ways and according to the ways of this world, but according to his divine will. John chapter 8 verse 31, Jesus says, if ye continue in my word, then are ye my disciples indeed. 
if you continue in my word, in my instruction, in the command that I have given you, then you are my disciples indeed. And Jesus further says in John chapter 14, verse 23, if a man love me, if a man love me, he will keep my words and my father will love him and we will come unto him and make our abode with him. We read 2 Corinthians chapter 6 uh, at the end, uh, Apostle Paul tells us that God has made us the temple of the Holy Spirit. And that's what Jesus is saying here. We will come unto him and make our dwelling with him. If any man loves me, he will keep my word. He that loveth me not, keepeth not my sayings, and the word which he hear is not mine, but the Father's which sent me. So, the moment a professing Christian says that he or she has their own way of living a Christian life, you can immediately write them off as non-Christian. They are a cause of stumbling and a cause to introduce error or even sin. Now, although verse 3 of our text tells us that we should not be a cause of offense in any part of our Christian way of life, here specifically, Paul is talking about the ministry of reconciliation, the ministry of preaching the gospel. Look at chapter 5. In chapter 5 of 2 Corinthians, and in verse 19, Paul tells us that the Lord has committed to us the word of reconciliation. And in verse 20 of the same chapter, that is chapter 5, he goes on to say that now we are the ambassadors for Christ. And therefore, 2 Corinthians chapter 6, verse 3, he writes, giving no offense in anything that the ministry be not blamed. Think about this. A person is called to follow the Lord Jesus Christ, but never opens his mouth to speak for the Lord when opportunity arises with his colleague at work or with a stranger or with a neighbor, <coughs> a family member or friends. Think about this. The Lord has saved you from eternal hell and has filled you with his grace to live a new life in the Spirit. But you never go out with the brethren in the church to stand on the street and hand out the gospel tracts. Or perhaps you have come to believe that this is a waste of time. For no one is interested in coming to the church. No one is interested in listening. Nevertheless, brethren, it is a command. And the command is, as Jesus has commanded his disciples in Matthew chapter 28, Go ye therefore and teach all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Ghost, teaching them to observe all things whatsoever I have commanded you. And lo, I am with you always, even unto the end of the world. Amen. The Lord Jesus Christ has called us to be the salt and the light of the world. What is this salt? And what is this light? It is the word of God. It is Christ dwelling in us, his word dwelling in us. It is the gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ. What is within us must come out in the open. That is one thing that Satan hates, and that is the gospel being preached out and made known openly. Why would the nations rage and try to shut down the gospel of Christ. 
It is because the enemies of the gospel and our own carnal self cannot bear to hear the truth and the restraints it brings upon our depraved souls. When I was converted to the Lord Jesus Christ, I used to work before with social activists, uh, very much fighting against social injustice in Goa, also the nudism that took place because of the tourism industry and, and many of our young people <clears throat> were taken up by drugs. And when I was converted, my social activist friends told me, because I began to talk about Jesus, uh, he, they said, look, you can live your new life, but you don't have to talk about it. You don't have to go on telling others. You see, others also have their own way, their own beliefs, their own way of life. Yet, the very work of social or political activist is to tell others their beliefs and their way of life. And they do it very militantly. Many a times you will meet an atheist and they will tell you, you know, we should not tell our children what to believe. So, please don't tell the children about God. Let them decide. When they grow up, they will decide for themselves. And yet, these very same people will indoctrinate their children to make them believe that there is no God. There is no God. They indoctrinate their children with the belief of evolution. One rule for Christians, another rule for their own self. And this is happening even with the gender issues and many other issues which the atheists and haters of the gospel put across. What did the Lord God tell the people of Israel? Isaiah 49, the Lord says to Israel, Thou art my servant, O Israel. I will give you for a light to the Gentiles, that you may be my salvation unto the end of the earth. Are you discouraged? Are you filled with doubts? Have you begun to think that your pastor does not have the right to call you to do the work of evangelism? Do you feel that you can spend your time doing better things than going out to be on the street for evangelism? Do you feel within you, why should I speak of the Lord when they are not interested? Let them go to hell. Is that your attitude? If you are thinking and believing anything like this or more, you are concentrating, dear friends, dear brethren, upon yourself and not on the Lord, your Redeemer, that has saved you and given you new life. You are not focused on the Lord Jesus Christ, who has broken his body for you and shed his blood for your salvation and my salvation. And therefore Paul goes to say in verse 4 of 2 Corinthians chapter 6 verse 4, but in all things approving ourselves as the ministers of God. In all things approving ourselves as the ministers of of God. He says, approving ourselves, or approve yourself as ministers, as servants of God. Approve means to stand and stand together. It means to establish yourself as servants of God. You see, the moment you forget that you are a servant of God, you will think you are the boss, that you have to call the shots. God calls us his 
ministers, his servants. Paul calls himself the born servant of Christ, meaning the slave of Christ. And what does the slave do? He obeys the instructions of his master. He is dead to himself. He simply has to do what his master tells him to do. And if you don't consider to be the servant of Christ, then you will make your own decisions for your personal gain. You will most of the time notice that those that don't want to be the servants of God will always want to be the boss of others. Those that do not have the spirit of meekness will in no way give into the commands of the Lord God Almighty. Meekness does not give glory to the flesh and to our carnal mind. Meekness is the heart of spiritual life, of godly life. And the Son of God was meek and he preached meekness. Blessed are the meek, he says. The Word of God calls us to stand, to establish ourselves as the servants of God. And this we are to do with the other brethren. And how are we to establish ourselves? as the ministers of God, as the servants of God, the word of God continues in verse 4. In much patience. In much patience. But in all things approving ourselves as the servants of God, in much patience, in afflictions, in necessities, in distresses, in much patience. Love is patient. God is love and he is patient. If God waited for you and me for so long, why can't we keep on going and telling people about the Lord to the lost souls? It is so very important if you think that you were quick to obey God and therefore the rest have to do the same, then you are not imitating God who is love and therefore patient. It is so very important, dear friends, that we decrease and Christ increase in us. In the ministry of reconciliation, being ambassadors of Christ, patience plays a very important role. Being patient is an attitude of God. We must put on the attitude of being patient. Not only are to put on the attitude of being patient, but the Word of God also tells us that we are to do this ministry in much affliction. Affliction, meaning there will be oppression. There will be pressure. There will be pressure from outside because there are people that will question you and throw verbal abuse at you and argue with you, distort the truth and so on. So there is pressure from outside. But there is also pressure from within. My flesh does not want to be under pressure. I don't want to be insulted. I don't want to be looked down upon. I want to guard myself from this pressure. Besides, there could be doubts and discouragements. I don't see any fruit of my labor. And so, there is so much discouragement that can come in. I feel uncomfortable to face the people of the world. So, there is affliction in the work of the gospel. But we got to stand, he says. We got to stand. We got to yet establish ourselves as the ministers, as the servants of the word of God. You see, we have, having, we, we say this word so often, ministers, ministers, and we, we apply this word 
to the rulers of our country and thing like that and they stand so high and we think ministers mean somebody great somebody great whom everybody has to bow down to no ministers mean servants they are our servants rulers are supposed to be our servants the 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 gospel preachers the pastors and we we ought to be servants to one another and then there is necessities necessities paul says i don't have a job or the money i get is not enough i need to work on saturday some even go to the extent of working on the lord's day of course if you are working as a nurse as a doctor and so on you cannot avoid that there can be other necessities that keeps us away from fulfilling the great commission to do the ministry of reconciliation it could be the necessity of rest for the body and relaxation and spending some time in entertainment watching a certain program on the tv on saturday as some people still don't want to give up tv on the lord's day every day is the same day although they are christians and are the disciples and the servants of the lord then there is distresses some kind of restriction trouble that brings anguish it seems there is no way out of this trouble the mind seems to be preoccupied with it all the time and you feel downcast and you have no interest to take up the work of the lord remember apostle paul is moved to write this for our benefit for our knowledge and understanding and to encourage us when we are faced with such challenges the wonderful thing is that apostle paul and his co-workers themselves were faced with such challenges most of the time in their christian life so paul is not giving a talk on evangelism but he is moved by the holy spirit to write what he himself has gone through he faced all these challenges and far more intimidating unnerving challenges than what we face today look what he says in 2 corinthians chapter 12 verse 10 therefore he says i take pleasure in infirmities in reproaches in necessities in persecutions in distresses for Christ's sake for whose sake not for his own sake but for Christ's sake for when i am weak then am i strong 2 corinthians chapter 12 verse 9 and he jesus said unto me he says my grace is sufficient for thee for my strength is made perfect in weakness most gladly therefore will i rather i rather glory in my infirmities that the power of christ may rest upon me the lord jesus christ understands fully our doubts our discouragement our the pressures that we go through the afflictions that we may face he is fully aware of this because he himself have gone through all this and his apostles have gone through all this but what is the witness of the apostles as they go through all these problems he says i take pleasure in infirmities in reproaches in necessities in persecution in distresses for 
Christ's sake, for he knows the value of his salvation. He knows what Christ has done for him. And so he says, I am okay, for when I am weak, for when I am weak, then I am strong. And that's the beauty, dear friends. That's the beauty of working for Christ Jesus, for being his servant. We being his servant, we are weak, but we see the strength in this weakness coming, the strength coming from Christ our Lord in us. Many times, if you ask the ministers, the preachers, the evangelists, what happens? How do you get the strength to stand and speak? You may even ask some pastors, is it easy for you to go on the pulpit and preach? I, for one, I feel very, very being insufficient. I am not able to be what I should be. But then, when this person comes on, on the pulpit, or when he goes on the street, everything is forgotten. Suddenly, there is a new dimension to, to what happens to his, his sermons as they preach the gospel. And they are assured, although they are weak, Christ makes them strong. And Jesus said unto me, My grace is sufficient for thee, for my strength is made perfect in weakness. Most gladly, therefore, will I rather glory in my infirmities that the power of Christ may rest upon me. And dear friends, we can take this same attitude in our day-to-day -day life, in our relationship with one another. You see, I am weak, Lord. I cannot go through this, but I am strong because of your grace, because of your strength, because meekness is a powerhouse, is a powerhouse, dear friends, that we receive from God. Now, you may say, must I yet do the Lord's work when I am afflicted, when I am in my necessities and in my distresses? Well, as I said, that I too, to some extent, experience these afflictions, necessities and distresses. You know, soon after my conversion, I was thrown out of my business because of my belief in Christ. My economic situation became very grim, yet I chose to do only part-time work back in India so that I could spend the rest of the time in evangelism. And God was gracious to give me this job and we survived. He gave me this part-time job, and we survived with this part-time job. But soon this job also came to an end. And then the Lord provided a radio ministry, gospel ministry on the radio, but the pay was far, far small. I could hardly pay my monthly bills. And yet, we survived. We survived. God is able to provide our basic needs, and He will. He will. This is His promise. But we must go through that fire, for He is with us through that. He wants to change us. He wants to mold us and make us into His image and likeness. Well, read chapter 12 of the Gospel of Luke. As the Lord said, do not be anxious. Do not be anxious. First seek God's kingdom, and the rest will be added to you. Oh, dear friends, brethren, it depends how much you're willing to stand, to establish yourself to be the servant of God. It depends if you're willing to be content with what the Lord God provides for you. Are you content for where your treasure is? There your heart will be. A Christian life, dear friends, is not a bed of roses, as the prosperity gospel preachers make it to be. The life of our Savior itself 
is a perfect example as to how he totally depended upon his father for everything. He was persecuted by different groups of people all the time. If they have persecuted me, Jesus says, they will persecute you also. But let us read a few more verses from 2 Corinthians chapter 6. Uh, let us read from verse 4 onward. Verse 4. As Paul says, But in all things, approving ourselves as the ministers of God, in much patience, in afflictions, in necessities, in distresses, in stripes, in imprisonments, in tumults, in labors, in watchings, in fastings, by pureness, by knowledge, by long suffering, by kindness, by the Holy Ghost, by love unfeigned, by the word of truth, by the power of God, by the armor of righteousness on the right hand and on the left, by honor and dishonor, by evil report and good report, as deceivers and yet true, as unknown and yet well known, as dying and behold we live, as chastened and not killed, as sorrowful yet always rejoicing, as poor yet making many rich, as having nothing and yet possessing all things. Well, what do we see here? In the midst of dark, gloomy, and life-threatening environment of Paul's life and his associates, we see so much of positive, refreshing, victorious, exciting, joyful, rich, secure, goodness, life of fame, high self-esteem, and honor experienced by the servants of God. Isn't that amazing? Isn't that amazing? Paul is saying, yes, we are crushed, and yet we are alive. We are totally flattened, and yet we stand with dignity. How wonderful, dear friends, this life is of the servant, of being the servant of Christ Jesus. To live a life as a servant of God is a life lived to the full with men and with God. On one side, you lose it all, but on the other hand, you gain it all. And the gain is eternal. The gain is eternal, everlasting. The gain part is a life with Christ, here, now, and for eternity. Let us then, as workers together with Christ, receive not the grace of God in vain. Let us pray. O glorious God, indeed thou give us the taste of what it means to live as thy servants, as thy slaves. And thou, O Lord, have recorded for us the lives of thy servants, right from Abel and then the prophets and Moses, the judges, Christ our Savior himself, and the apostles, and the disciples. And Lord, in all this, thou show us that we are not the losers if we but follow thy ways, looking unto thee, O Lord, and thee alone, that we may be imitators of thy Son, Jesus Christ. O oh, gracious Father, help us, O oh Lord, to make this decision.
to follow thee not any man but thee and O Lord to have a meek and humble heart in following thee gracious father the uh, we pray that we will receive this taste in whichever life we are living Lord that Lord we may know that we are thy servants in any part of or department of our life and that thou o Lord will use it for thy glory in Jesus name we pray amen shall we take him number 120 120